Hi, thank you all for being flexible this morning. I hope you enjoyed the coffee um, reception and thank you so much to Gregory for that very informative and exciting um, presentation. I think everyone's very much so looking forward to the break and to going on tours, but more so they're probably also looking forward to the first panel this morning um, put together by Michelle Yun and Adriana Prosner, both from the Asia Society. Unfortunately, Michelle was pulled away on work business and not able to be here, but Adriana is and will be moderating the panel. And so we'll begin with them. Good morning. Um, I, uh, I want to start actually by thanking Judith and her predecessor, Sally Block, and also the conference committee, particularly Julian Cox, for their uh, advice. And of course, I want to thank Meredith Dean for all the help that she's given me and, and us um, in organizing uh, this, this conference. Um, as Judith just mentioned, Michelle Yun uh, actually is currently in Hong Kong, so she, um, she's unable to join us and unfortunately um, uh, she was unable to get out of that, that other commitment um, which came up later. Uh, and I know that she'd be, she's, she really is disappointed not to be here, um, not only because she wanted to be with all of us, but also because she in fact was a graduate of the high school here at Cranbrook, and I know that she has lots of fond memories of sneaking out of the dormitories at night. <laughs> um, Michelle and I organized this panel to consider case studies and new models of how American curators are collaborating with colleagues at museums and artists in Asia. Following this introduction, panelist uh, panelists Madhubati Ghosh, Aldorf Associate Curator of Indian, East Asian, Himalayan, and Islamic Art at the Art Institute of Chicago, Anita Jung, uh, Curator of Chinese Art at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and Yasufumi Nakamori, Associate Curator of Photography at the MFA in Houston, are each going to pre uh, present case studies. I'll then be moderating a uh, discussion with the panelists and finally we will open um, the um, discussion to the floor and I really do hope that uh, there are those among you who, will, who have had experience with, is experiences working in Asia as well who will be able to share your stories uh, also. Um, so our motivations for this panel uh, include a number of factors. Uh, among them is that uh, although China had just 25 museums in 1949, as of last December there were 3,866 museums in China and that number is still go growing. Um, I think I, they keep on upping the number of the goal. I think it was up to like 6,000 that they're planning at this point. Um, Anita, you maybe, maybe you're more up on those last uh, data. Um, and um, new museums are also being constructed in many other countries in Asia. Um, in addition, historians are, are saying that the current rise of Asia is the start of the first major uh, global power shift since the 17th century. So uh, things are, are really going to be changing in the future in the way that um, that our continent uh, interacts with, with uh, the rest of the world. Um, last year, uh, um, the Asia Society held the first annual Arts and Museum Summit in Hong Kong. And <clears throat> this is a summit that brings together museum professionals from Asia, North America, Europe, and, Europe, and Hong Kong, uh, Europe in Hong Kong to engage in face-to-face -face discussions. Um, and this has, we've started this because of this, this growth in Asia. And um, it's intended to identify and navigate the challenges and potential opportunities developing in the new museum ecology in Asia and provides professional development and collaborative exchange opportunities among museums internationally. Um, and we wanted to, um, 
to really open up this, this discussion. Um, although we ourselves, let me see if this is. <laughs> Could, do I just hit enter? Okay. Um, uh, we ourselves over, over many years have done numerous exhibitions in Asia. Uh, this is a 2006 exhibition that we did with China and in particular Inner Mongolia. Um, art in China's Revolution in 2008, um, dealing with uh, modern art in China. Uh, ancient arts, uh, arts of ancient Vietnam uh, in 2010, uh, the Buddhist heritage of Pakistan, Art of Gandhara, which was a show that, with objects from Pakistan in 2011, um, Revolutionary Ink, the paintings of Wu Guangzhong, a show that included paintings from the Shanghai Art Museum in uh, 2012. This is an artist who just passed away a couple of years ago. Um, and currently, in fact, I'm still somewhat jet lagged because I just got back from Myanmar. Currently, we're organizing the Buddhist art of Myanmar, um, which will open at Asia Society in February this coming year. Um, and those are just some, some pictures I threw in there, especially the cute white elephant, <laughs> which is one of the really wonderful things that one can see in Myanmar. And also, um, just this detail with our guest curator, Don Statner, and just wanted to point out, uh, let's see if this, whoops, uh, pointer, no, no pointer. Um, but you can see that um, he's standing next to a pedestal, and I just wanted to point out that that sculpture that's on top of the pedestal is cemented into the pedestal, which is something that one, uh, finds quite commonly in South and Southeast Asia. So those are special kinds of challenges we get to deal with when we, we deal with Asia. Um, so even though we've worked with Asia a lot, we really wanted to hear about um, uh, and what other curators' experiences have been at other institutions and um, share those experiences uh, with, with colleagues here and our counterparts. And without further ado, uh, I think now we'll just bring up our, our first speaker who's going to be uh, Madhu Ghosh. And um, thank you all for, for coming and uh, we look forward to continuing the discussion after the presentations. Thank you so much, Adriana, for not just um, your introduction, but for inviting and putting this panel together. Um, I'm Madhu Ghosh um, from the Art Institute of Chicago. And um, I've decided that um, I'll talk about um, a particular program that we have started at the Art Institute. Um, simply, I will be referring to it as the Museum Excellence Program, even though it has a very nice big name called the Vekanand Memorial Program for Museum Excellence. The test at the end is going to be repeating that. Uh, <laughs> so um, I thought I would talk about that because uh, some of our colleagues you're gonna hear from in the panel will talk about their experiences with exhibitions. We have some challenges with regard to exhibitions as well that we can talk about uh, during the discussion. But um, first to a positive story, I hope. Um, so the government of India approached us uh, several years ago now because it was coming up for the 150th anniversary of a very renowned Indian philosopher, Swami Vivekanand. And for all of you, um, the Art Institute of Chicago is a renowned art museum. However, for Indians, they don't know what the Art Institute is. For them, it is the site of where Swami Vivekanand, during the 1893 World Parliament of Religions, came and presented one of the most important speeches that talked about uh, dialogue between the East and the West. 
And every year we have hundreds of Indians coming to actually just view this site, do darshan as you would in a temple. And so um, his 150th anniversary was coming up and the government of India approached us that they wanted to erect a statue in his honor. And we said, um, well, and we've said this to them before, well, we're an art museum, we don't really have busts, we can't have hordes of pilgrims coming and putting offerings, you know, in Fullerton Hall. Um, so in this cross uh, dialogue uh, between cultures without everyone trying to offend each other, um, we finally said, you know, we're a museum and perhaps what you'd like to do is let's collaborate and spend the money in a way that would perhaps help your museums. And so that was really the inception of this Museum Excellence Program. And um, this agreement that you're seeing um, the picture of was signed in January 2012. And the program really commenced um, from 2012-13. Um, that was the first year. So what is the program? The program consists of us um, selecting collaboratively with the Ministry of Culture of the Government of India a particular subject that we teach for one year. And uh, this is a, we were given a grant for four years, so it's part of a four year grant, whereby each year we select a very um, important subject in our minds. They wanted us to do things like, um, you know, uh, visitor experiences and we said, no, let's start with the collections. You saw, for example, Adriana showing um, a, a picture of the museum in uh, Burma. Well, that could be any museum in India, even the greatest museums. So we really wanted to start with uh, the back back of house, uh, while they really wanted us to start with the front of house. Every year we have a program that um, starts in the heat of the summer. It's a really jolly time to go to India. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we gather in the musty rooms uh, the first couple of years of the National Museum Institute in Delhi where uh, everyone from um, the, the ministers and, you know, I mean, we have a whole day which is dedicated to the ceremonial, and then we actually get down to business with the fellows who are selected. And so we gather for about three days in uh, India um, to um, introduce the fellows who are selected to the program of that year, and also to discuss the curriculum in detail. We need to fill up in you know, quite extensive questionnaires on their institutions and their goals. And they have to be really truthful from whether it's the staffing of their institution to what facilities they have. And then they all come to Chicago and um, for several weeks of uh, training on the subject that's been selected. So for example, for the first year, we selected collections management and preventive care. And the second year, which we're just finishing up, is on best practices, museum best practices and all things, but that includes things like dusting. Um, I think one of the most important um, takeaways has been dust. <laughs> because if you know Asia, and particularly South Asia, dust is a massive problem in these museums. Uh, and the idea that we sit and discuss dust in great detail for these middle management people from Indian museums, they find hysterical initially. And then I'm, I send them back, and they have to do about almost six months of follow-up work, where we have um, regular monthly telephone calls, conference calls. We, we were very ambitious to begin with, and we were doing uh, Skype. But in fact, one of the challenges of Skype, I don't know whether you've, any of you have faced that, is when you try to bring a big group together on Skype, that fails. So all our you know, great technological advancements resulted in lots of like, hello, can you hear me? Can you see me? 
Um, and at 6.30 in the morning in the winter in Chicago, when we are work coming into work to do that, that is not happy experience, I can tell you. <laughs> so anyway, they have to stay behind at 6 o'clock in the evening to do these calls. And we, in the winter, have to do it at 6.30 in the morning. And religiously, the whole institution, all the relevant people gather at that time to do these calls. Um, so during the follow-up regime that they have to, I mean, depending on the subject, they have a very extensive uh, list of things that we send them off. It starts with things like they have to um, initially um, just give presentations in their own institutions. I mean, just that is a big deal for them. Then they have to uh, share their experience and give presentations to regional institutions. I started that as, because I really wanted them to not treat the trip uh, to Chicago as a jolly. You know, it's, it's like, oh, we're going for two, three weeks of nice vacation in America, and now we can forget about the program when we come back. Um, they tried to initially do that, and then they soon realized that they were getting backlogged. And the way in which they have to repeat themselves, um, repeat what they've learned, helps them to really then own the material themselves. Um, and then they have to identify short-term and long-term measures of improvement for their own institutions. And that really has been where some of the most exciting things have happened. And the last part of the program is that um, there's a nodal agency in India with, to which we send best practices on all kinds of things related to museums, and it's their job to disseminate that information, however much good that does. But anyway, that was written in, into the agreement by the Indians. Um, so, of course, one of the major goals has been, you know, to strengthen uh, the relationship between India, these museum directors, um, and I, I want to emphasize here that uh, the Art Institute is working with some of India's most major museums. This is all about working to help uh, and collaborate with the museums that are directly funded by the national government of India. So that includes the National Museum in Delhi, all the National Gallery of Modern Arts, uh, regional museums, again, but that are funded directly by the government, and all of the Archaeological Survey of India museums, that is over 50-something museums, plus all the National Council for Science Museums. So it really is a very large number of museums that are directly funded by the government that we're working with. So um, it obviously impacts um, our relations with some of these um, directors and the ministry itself, which then has uh, an impact on our work in um, um, that other work that we want to do. It has taken a lot of effort, um, you know, across the museum, people have collaborated on um, uh, each of these training courses. And so from a, a Art Institute point of view, it has meant a huge amount of human resource that has gone into training. And that has also then had an impact on um, um, our understanding of the challenges, but also the opportunities of collaborating with our colleagues. And um, one of the other things that has resulted is the fact that these fellows get to bond with each other. In India, there are very few opportunities for museums to collaborate, uh, or even colleagues within an, in, uh, an institution to talk to each other. The program is really kind of assisted in that, which really has been one of the really exciting outcomes. Um, and more, more importantly, it has resulted in meaningful change within these institutions. And we've been able to work with the government of India to get all the museums signed up on a single database management program, um, a partic uh, one particular platform. We helped them uh, select this uh, program, and it's called Jatan. And now it's going to be uniformly rolled out. Uh, right now there are 10 pilot uh, museums who are working on it, but it's going to be rolled out across all of the museums of India. So India is going to have a single uh, platform eventually. This is one of our brightest fellows from last year um, in a tiny little archaeological museum uh, in a lake. 
uh, in the south of India, but he turned out to be the one that has been able to do the most. And here's our Fullerton Hall where um, this speech happened and where this program's um, uh, concept really um, started from. This is the site where Swami Vivekanand initially made his speech. We've seen some great improvements in the short amount of time that we've been working together and a complete change in attitude about uh, some very, very meaningful changes, which uh, to us sitting here in America might seem small, but in India, it's making a lot of change. So it's been a wonderful experience. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Anita Chong, and I'm the curator of Chinese art at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, because I specialize in Chinese art, so for me, uh, traveling to China or to, uh, to study the art resources in China is something very basic. And so, um, especially when we think about it, there are so many um, new discovery in archaeology in China, and um, in the old days when we studied Chinese art history, um, we do not have a lot of direct access to the collection in China. And now, um, um, with the opening of China, and we really have many opportunities to collaborate or to do research in China. So from a personal point of view, uh, for curatorial research, it is, it is something very natural for us to keep going back and to, to work with our colleagues there and also to discover all the resources and to do research. But what I see now um, um, in America in the, uh, the last decades as after I've worked in Cleveland, what I feel is that there is um, now an um, increasing uh, institutional effort to um, establish the relationship with China. And this year, for the AAM um, uh, meeting, um, coming meeting in um, Seattle, uh, May 18th to 21st, and there is indeed, um, there will be a China program. And the theme of this China program for the AAM is about um, exchange of exhibition between America and China. So um, today I'm going to share with you um, some of the projects that I have been uh, doing um, um, uh, when, uh, when the museum would like to have more collaboration with China. And one of the projects was um, our tour of um, uh, the Cleveland collection of Impressionists and Modern Masters, um, uh, uh, our collection uh, to China, and uh, actually to Asia in general, um, because we also toured that exhibition to, um, uh, not only to Beijing, uh, but to uh, the Murray Art Museum in, um, uh, in Japan, and also uh, in two other venues in Korea. So that was an opportunity um, uh, to, uh, to show our collection to, uh, to the audience uh, in Asia. What happened was that um, because our museum um, has to go through a period of renovation and we have just completely reopened our, um, um, the new wing and all the, all the new galleries are, um, have been opened and they are all newly renovated. But we have closed our collection and closed the galleries for an extended period of time. And for some years, uh, we have this idea of when we closed the museum and put all the paintings in storage, why, why didn't we um, consider touring these collections to Asia? And so what we try to do is that there, that there are um, many different projects, and one of which was uh, the tour of um, our, um, our Western art collection uh, uh, to, uh, to Asia, uh, to different venues um, in, uh, in Korea, in Japan, and also in China. And um, this is... Um, an example, this is actually the open ceremony uh, we have in the World Art Museum uh, in Beijing. And um, that exhibition uh, was in 2006. And then um, uh, what we can see here is that um, in, in China, they took it very seriously. Um, <laughs> you look at the, the flat of China, the flat of America they are, that are placed together. And this is very interesting that, of course, there, the opening ceremony was very uh, serious. I mean, very uh, formal. A lot of flowers and a lot of officials, uh, important speeches, uh, one after the other. And here we have our director, uh, the former director, um, um, Timothy Rupp, uh, giving uh, an official speech. 
And I would like to share with you more about the challenges and, uh, the, and also the reward of doing that kind of exhibition. But to me, it is really uh, something very exciting because if you think about uh, all the museums in China, they mostly collect uh, Chinese art. And actually, in every aspect of Chinese art, they have so many experts, so many resources, but they do not uh, have a collection of uh, other uh, uh, other cultural area beyond China. And so the new generations in particular, uh, uh, they are very, they, they're very eager to learn about uh, 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 the Western art or uh, especially contemporary art now in the, global, in, uh, in the global world. And so for them to have a chance to see all these masterpieces uh, or the big names in Western art history and to see the original painting in China was a big thing to them. And so just this idea of sharing uh, art resources, the idea that art belongs to everybody, um, uh, to be able to share our resources uh, to a wider audience is something which I think is very worthwhile to pursue. But of course, there are a lot of challenges, and one of those is, I think we're going to go through this uh, later more in our discussions, was about uh, bridging uh, the, uh, the, the gap and because there's always a, a lot of uh, different ways of practices um, in, in the museum world. And in China, in particular, they may not be, our colleagues are not particularly familiar with the way how we conduct business here in the West. And so this is really something very interesting that it is a kind of a collaborative project. It's not only that our colleagues in Asia have to learn from us, and we ourselves have to learn from our colleagues there because I feel that one of the fundamental, um, uh, um, one of the fundamental uh, uh, principle is that we have to respect and to learn from each other is rather than just imposing our way. And in this whole uh, collaborative project, I find that there are actually many, um, uh, uh, there are actually many, many steps of learning from each other and uh, just, just like uh, this, uh, what we can see here, um, they do not have a, a Western painting conservator working in China, but for them to work with get together with our conservators to examine the painting, to talk about the insurance, to talk about um, uh, the way we install the, uh, the exhibition. Um, this has a very positive impact in, in the way how we uh, introduce a certain international standards to China. But at the same time, because of, uh, of, the, of the way uh, they deal with contracts, the way uh, they do exhibition, they, they are always cultural differences. And there are always language difference. I mean, sometimes we have to spend a lot of time in translating the language and also translating the cultural difference so that we are, we are able to do all this uh, um, in, uh, in a fruitful way. And um, uh, if we look at these images, you can really see that it is really um, uh, 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 rewarding because here, these two um, uh, gentlemen, they are major uh, masters uh, of oil painting in China. And for them to be able to look at original uh, impressionist work of art, and they themselves uh, learn from the Soviet uh, realistic style. And so for them to be able to see all this is really uh, uh, the, the the reward of the exhibition. And this is uh, actually um, um, uh, an image showing how uh, when we tour Western work um, uh, to China or to, uh, this is the scene in Korea, uh, it has attracted a lot of audience. So when we do exhibition on Western art and to bring it to China, they have to rely a lot of the expertise of the curators here in the West. And, um, we have another exhibition um, that was done uh, very recently when the Shanghai Museum was celebrating its 60th anniversary. I feel that this is also another interesting model that we can uh, consider. And here we are actually the first time touring our Chinese painting uh, collection uh, uh, in America to China. And this involved not only our museum, but also the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and also the Nelson Atkins Museum. So this involved a group of curators and also the different museums working together in order to bring the best of the Chinese art resources back to China and to show it there. And this is a, 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 an image of the, of the opening um, of, the, of the exhibition in, uh, in Shanghai. Again, um, our Chinese um, uh, uh, colleagues uh, took 
this kind of international exchange very seriously, and they often have um, um, uh, a lot of press conferences, and then uh, with inviting all the directors uh, from the different museum and also the trustees from uh, uh, from uh, America to attend the ceremony. So. We, this is really a, a group portrait showing that how it involves so many curators and also directors all working together to bring the show uh, to, uh, to China. And um, again, when you see the, all the audience, um, um, uh, they took uh, so much interest in uh, that kind of international exhibition. And it, it tells you that it is really rewarding, even though we have to deal with years of planning. Um, uh, it involves uh, in, uh, resolving the issue of uh, the anti, because there was no anti seizure law, we have to think about uh, the safe return of the Chinese materials ba uh, back from China to America. And also, we have to uh, consider the the high insurance costs, uh, uh, the values of the artwork touring uh, to Asia, and therefore you need different um, um, uh, different flights and, and different uh, groups of uh, courier to to bring the artworks to Asia. But um, but it is actually a, a, a very complex project, but still very rewarding when you can see that uh, how the artwork can bring uh, the people um, of different continents together. So um, this is really just two projects that uh, that we have um, uh, done recently with uh, with China. And um, what I can say is that um, we have a lot of uh, 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 good feedback. Uh, the audience, in particular, enjoyed this kind of exhibition um, uh, in Asia. And for us, we learn a lot from our colleagues also because we, we have to deal with very complex um, uh, bureaucratic procedure in China, working with uh, the government and also uh, dealing with issues uh, like indemnity, uh, like uh, in, uh, uh, also um, uh, uh, a provenance issue and um, to uh, to deal with the different contracts and because the way we deal with contracts here in, in America can be very different from the contract that has to be approved by the Chinese government so but but I have to say that nothing um, uh, uh, is impossible and we can still resolve all these problems it's all about uh, learning from each other and to gain a degree of uh, mutual understandings and respect and I can see that um, uh, in uh, uh, in the next decade, there will be more and more that kind of collaborations uh, between uh, museums in different countries. Thank you. Uh, how do I go to my... My show, yeah, show me. Oh, I see it here. Got it. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Hi, this is Yasufumi Nakamori, uh, associate curator of photography at the Museum of Science Houston. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Adriana, and also Michelle, uh, inviting me to be part of this, you know, really exciting panel. Um, I will actually give a little different talk, uh, sort of like a sharing my personal experiences uh, in terms of creating exhibition coming up at MFA Houston. Uh, it's called For a New World to Come, uh, Experiments in Art and Photography in Japan, focusing on uh, 1968, the period 1968 to 1979. Um, so just want to tell you how you know, this, this exhibition idea came about. Uh, and of course, uh, in 2003, uh, Ann Tucker, uh, you know, our, our founding curator of the Department of Photography at MFA Houston, uh, she worked with actually a number of Japanese curators to do exhibition, a really important show, a history of Japanese photography. So by the time I joined the museum in uh, 2008, there was a really meaningful uh, infrastructure, uh, you know, of pursuing uh, further collecting and interpreting uh, Japanese photography. Uh, in our collections, I think we have like 29,000 photographs. I think we have uh, uh, close to 1,000 pictures uh, made in Japan covering you know, entire history of photography. Particularly, uh, you know, we are strong, like 650, almost 700 pictures were made uh, in post-war, post-1945 Japan. 
So I had a really fortunate uh, you know, environment where I could actually further narrow down uh, the area uh, you know, of history, uh, which I would like to interpret, looking around actually the important exhibitions and scholarship which came out in the last 10 years. So the, this, you know, this di discursive uh, uh, field of uh, uh, you know, modernism, well, particularly uh, conceptualism and you know, experimental use of camera, uh, they have been made into an exhibitions. You know, uh, last picture show at the Walker, and also uh, you know, last, uh, last show on that subject matter was uh, Light Years. Uh, you know, which uh, Chicago Art Institute did a couple of years ago, but none of those exhibitions uh, touching upon conceptual photography uh, did include uh, uh, non-Western materials. So I felt there's a strong need to uh, make a, a, a story, transnational uh, uh, you know, narrative of uh, photographic uh, conceptualism. So that was sort of like an area uh, I was very much interested in uh, when I you know, began thinking about this show. So from there, of course, uh, I spoke to my colleagues in the field, uh, not only uh, you know, Japan, US, uh, scholars and curators, they have an interest in conceptualism and photography, and also Japanese materials in Europe as well. So I've, I sense that there's a, a strong demand uh, for the materials I'm going to bring in as exhibition, and also you know, scholarly catalog, uh, just to disseminate, you know, our research, uh, collective research, as well as, you know, our collections, and also what's out there uh, in the world uh, looking at Japanese materials of this uh, particular period. And of course, Thomas Shomei, you know, as you know, uh, he was giving a, a social show at the SF MoMA a couple of, many years ago, but he was the kind of breaking point of this exhibition, looking at 68, iconic 68, as the, the beginning of the sort of like a revolutionary period in Japanese art where, uh, you know, the norms and traditions were almost contem you know, com completely, uh, you know, disregarded and demantled. Um, so exhibition begins with actually 68. And then uh, kind of contextualize what happened, you know, uh, for a couple of years, 68, 69, 70 in Japan as a sort of like a, a you know, engine for uh, artists and also photographers to uh, pick up a camera and go through uh, really interesting experiments. You know, someone like uh, Nakahira Takuma, uh, who was a part of the very important uh, uh, 1968 photography collective uh, Provoke. Um, he basically, you know, shot at the light source uh, with a high-speed camera often. Uh, his body was almost kind of tilted. So everything that he photographed is, you know, right angle tilted. And then uh, he developed the film at a higher temperature. So his pictures came out all, almost always uh, blurry, out of focus, uh, grainy pictures. Um, so, you know, I'm just going to show you a few pictures uh, by Nakahira. So Nakahira kind of wraps these exhibitions around. Uh, his development as a photographer uh, starting uh, mid-60s throughout 70s uh, gives the, uh, you know, sort of like a, a big uh, overreaching context for the exhibition. Uh, he himself changed his uh, picture making from the, you know, blurry, grainy pictures to more straight color photographs. Uh, at the end, he was interested in actually photographed by uh, Ache just to uh, uh, accurately portray what was happening in the city. So there was a, a big transformation in not only Nakahira's work, but also many other uh, artists who are not trained as a photographer, as well as photographers. So I'm tracing this uh, transformation uh, of select artists uh, in these exhibitions and also the catalog uh, productions. Uh, someone like Nakahira, you know, starts shooting with the color a little bit later, uh, very much interested in, uh, you know, this phenomena he found in the street. And then 1974, he made uh, this fantastic uh, 48 color picture installation. It's a six feet high and I think 17 feet wide. This is in the collections of uh, uh, National Museum of Modern Art, Tokyo. Uh, 
they have been fantastic, actually, partner for this project. Uh, this installation will come to MFA Houston for first time, actually, ever. The National Museum of Tokyo is letting this go, this piece go out of Japan. Uh, so there are a lot of actually installations uh, done in 70s will be reconstructed in the Houston galleries. Uh, another work uh, done by Sam Nakahira, uh, something he's done for uh, 71 uh, Paris Biennale, where he set up a bulletin board and he actually photographed in a street for six days. He actually borrowed the dark room by Chris Marker and he actually added pictures overnight. So this is sort of ongoing, kind of mutative uh, uh, picture wall he did. So we are trying to create something like this in Houston as well. So for this, uh, I worked with actually uh, scholars and also you know dealers who work with Nakahira. Nakahira himself actually uh, has a you know fairly advanced stage of Alzheimer. So uh, there's the collaborations uh, between me and also scholars and and you know other professionals in Japan uh, for recreating actually work of this kind. Let me just show you a few other pictures. Uh, Nomura Hitoshi is another artist who will be, uh, uh, he's a sculptor. Uh, as early as 1970, he made this uh, you know, 19 feet by 19 feet actually photographic mural, uh, which consists of 34 works. He was a sculptor. He was not interested in creating a beautiful photographs at all. So he rather wanted to sculpt time through camera. So he simply traced his uh, journey uh, and then he marked down the time. So the picture is really uh, indexical of his uh, journey. Uh, he made actually one day uh, in 1970 in Kyoto. So this actually uh, installation also comes from uh, Tokyo National Museum of Modern Art to Museum of Fine Houston next year. So uh, all of this actually, uh, I gathered my scholarly colleagues, uh, particularly uh, one uh, which I like to know, uh, Oral History Archive of Japanese Art, uh, which consists of uh, 16 art historians and curators, uh, both in US and Japan, including myself. We've given more than 70 artists, uh, curators, critics, even dealers you know, in, a, in a senior age, uh, full uh, you know, recollections of their involvement in art from 60s and 70s. So the archive was there uh, for me to think about this project from larger perspective. Uh, particularly 1970 uh, Tokyo Biennale, uh, Man and Matter, which was actually the first attempt uh, in Japanese art to bring in uh, international artists such as Carl Andre, Jan Devitt. Um, There's a lot of actually uh, important artists were uh, in Tokyo for this particular uh, art festival. So, um, and then Nomura, as a matter of fact, was included in, in the exhibition. So I'm trying to see this exhibition as a, as a forum to bring the issue of international simultaneity, which is actually conceptualism and exp ex ex experimental, experimentalism are happening, you know, uh, good eye show at the Guggenheim, as well as at Tokyo and New Avant-Garde, 55 to 70, which is a uh, Dorian Chan did the show at the MoMA. So, so we're all thinking kind of collaboratively how we expand this field in terms of exhibitions and discursively. So that's a really new thing to us. It's pretty exciting. Thank you. I wanted to mention a, a couple of facts and then um, talk a little bit about um, international standards, whether we need to develop some international standards for collaborations and in what areas these standards might be most critical. And I think <clears throat> for those of you who, um, who haven't, well, you may be aware of, of this working with, with other countries as well, but of course, um, working with Asia, what often comes up and is immediately apparent as you start to work on an exhibition is that um, the United States doesn't have a Ministry of Culture. And um, this is uh, a hurdle that one always has to find some way to, to get, get past and, and to get around. Um, and then something else that we didn't really discuss is, is when I'm talking about standards, for example, is that um, for, 
for exhibition, uh, most, most of us, when we do an exhibition, a special exhibition, it's gonna be a three month time slot on average. Uh, in China, for example, the time slots are much, much shorter. They tend to be about one month. Um, and uh, I just like to have some thoughts about how, how, for example, your institutions, when working, working with China, working with India, how were you able to negotiate that? I think um, the business of the Ministry of Culture is a big issue, and Asia Society, in fact, has been uh, leading in getting museum directors and curators together, uh, both in India and in China, to um, and, and not just museum curators and directors, but also people who work in the field of culture, uh, together to actually try to understand um, some of these problems. Because in the first place, if your museum has never worked with any of these countries, the first thing that the curator does is go to the director and say, I've got this great idea. Well, once you actually start working on it, the first thing you will face is that these ministries, you know, um, they work in a very different way from uh, the way we're used to collaborating with other museums. So that poses a lot of challenges in that you're really speaking at cross purposes many, on many occasions. Um, and it takes um, a huge amount of effort. And I, I would like to say honestly that a lot of our work on India started with a project that did not happen, um, in that we were part of a contract an exhibition and eventually could not take that exhibition because um, the insurance values of the uh, art that was about to be sent to us triple three times because the screening review um, that set the prices happened about a week before the art was to be shipped. And uh, by then, the, the curator um, uh, concerned from uh, the host um, museum had already published the catalog. Everything was ready to go. And this business of the screening committee happening literally um, in the last month before the art is to be shipped, um, the Ministry of Culture could not understand why we had a problem with that. And um, uh, so essentially, um, what Asia Society started to do was have these collaborative meetings so that we could at least talk about our processes versus their processes, and then try to at least create dialogue. And that dialogue now, in the case of India, has resulted in us um, helping the Ministry of Culture um, get an edited version of the old um, rules um, on um, exhibitions being loaned from India as well as exhibitions coming in. Um, and we are now collaborating on um, giving more advice on how this, uh, this um, ruling could be further improved. So we can't say that we've reached the final point, but at least there's dialogue, there's conversation, they're asking for examples of what other countries do. So sometimes something negative can have a positive, but it really is because up to now, exhibitions have happened country to country, bilateral. So the examples of Indian exhibitions in the United States happened because in the 80s, there was something called the Festival of India. And many of your museums might have collaborated on it, but that was done from the government to the US government. And that is not the way current exhibitions happen. Current exhibitions happen from museums, but in these countries you have to work through their ministries of culture. And because we don't have the State Department standing behind us, that does pose a challenge in how we converse and the language in which we speak. Uh, talking about international standard, I think one thing we learned is that um, yes, the way uh, the, 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 the museum practice in, in other countries may be very different from what we are doing here, but with dialogue, I totally agree, um, there are ways to 
uh, to get the two uh, institutions or the countries working more closer together. Of course, we have to respect the fact that, say, if you work with other countries, they have the Ministry of Culture. And especially if you work with a state uh, museum, they have to follow the uh, government rules. And here, uh, one interesting example is that uh, we, we have our own museum lawyer, we have our own contract, but they have their own contract. And just to refine the terms of whether if there's any dispute, do you follow Chinese law, or you follow what kind of law? I mean, they, 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 these are some of the technical uh, uh, issues that we have to deal with a lot, and there are a lot of cultural differences. But I do believe that for us to be willing to work together, we have to, uh, to be willing to be a little bit more flexible in understanding the perspective of your partner, and then to find a way I, I feel that what is interesting is that for those museums who are willing to work internationally like that, um, there is a willingness to learn. And if it is the standard is about the safety of art, everybody will be willing to upgrade their standard in order to reach inter international level. And so the, the, the beauty of this kind of show is that we are able to uh, 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 enhance or persist certain kind of uh, acceptable international uh, standard uh, so that uh, for doing exhibition, for promoting scholarship, uh, for our safety, I'm sure that it will have a positive impact. But you cannot change the rule or the, uh, the law of another, of another country and then we just have to be finding ways uh, to have a degree of uh, respect and trust and, and talking about the Shanghai exhibition, I'm actually my colleague Jane Porter is also in the audience and we work very closely together because Boston, the Met, and Nelson Atkins and Cleveland, we are all working together. And, and we have spent years, uh, have a lot of meetings to resolve a lot of differences uh, between the practice here in America and the practice in Shanghai. But in the end, I think we all agree that it was a very rewarding experience and actually Jane can correct me. I mean, she's in the audience, yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm mindful of the time, and I know we're, we're running late today, but I would like to open up um, the conversation to, to the audience, uh, um, both for questions and, and comments. Um, Jane, did you want to say something? Yeah. I think the, the microphone's coming along. The experience of collaborating with Shanghai was very, very positive and um, uh, I'd like to reiterate that with Anita, uh, the four museums working together. But I do have two questions and I'm afraid they're both about money because I think money is a really important aspect that you haven't talked about at all. And I worked at the British Museum, which was government funded, and I worked on a lot of exhibitions going to China and from China. And it was all because, you know, cultural diplomacy, government funded museums, there was an incentive to do it. Um, I came to the MFA, which is totally privately funded, and we do a lot of exhibitions with Japan, as you probably know, and we do it through media companies and we get large fees for the exhibitions. And I have found it quite challenging to work out a model of de sending exhibitions to China um, and to India, um, a financial model, because, um, so my questions are to Madhu, how the training program with the Indian curators funded? Did the Indian government fund the Art Institute of Chicago? Because, you know, it's a huge commitment for your director and all your staff to put time into training those Indian curators. And what does Chicago get out of it? I mean, that's the bottom line. And the same with Anita, with your exhibition from Cleveland to China of the Western masterpieces. Was that funded by, um, was there a fee from China to Cleveland, or did you get funding sponsorship from a Western company wanting to do business in China? How did it work financially in both cases? Thank you. Um, Jane, you know, that is in, in fact the reason why at the beginning I said that um, it takes a huge amount of directorial uh, commitment um, um, and that of the trustees. Um, they have to really desire to do this because many, many cases, um, staff are quite frightened about, and I'm going to be brutally honest and frank, there's no point in sugarcoating any of this. 
I mean, I often have our registry speaking to, say, colleagues in other museums. Um, our lawyers will speak to other colleagues in other museums that are working with um, you know, certain issues, simply because people are scared. Uh, about the time, the effort that it takes. With regard to the Museum Excellence Program, uh, because remember they wanted to put up the statue and it was his 150th, um, the program is completely funded by the Government of India. So what happens is that the Government of India gives us a grant, a four-year grant, plus um, it gives a grant to each of these museums. In fact, all of the museums are directly funded by the, uh, the Ministry of Culture, central government. And so many, many times these museums are not able to use up their funds. So they have to pay for their own fellows. And now we've actually, um, I didn't talk about this, but we've also added a level for directors because we found that the fellows without the director's engagement, they could not, you know, uh, I mean, you can send them back with all kinds of learnings, but if the director is not interested, it's still not gonna happen. So we've started to actually do a special program for directors as well. And uh, that is directly funded by each museum that attends. So there's a bit of the component that comes uh, directly to us from the ministry and the other component, um, they basically pay for themselves. So that is covered fully within the program and we did think it out before we um, agreed to doing it. But with exhibitions, it is a huge challenge. This is the reason why it's easier for me to do contemporary shows because I know I can raise the money for it locally in Chicago. And while any of my tradition-based shows take so long. So it, it's really, really the problem that you're facing, I'm facing. And it's also because Asia doing these things, um, we don't have a huge donor base. You know, we have a small pool of trustees and patrons that I've been cultivating for the last seven years since I've been there. So it's not that we have existing pots of money with people, you know, madly interested in Asia who are, you know, willing to write the checks or the corporates. In fact, corporate funding has decreased a lot. Um, so it really comes back to individual funds and uh, foundation. Um, so it, it really has been uh, one of the reasons why it's not that easy to churn these out annually. Uh, for, for funding, I mean, one thing that's very interesting is that I totally agree, because we do not have the Ministry of Culture here, and so um, it very much depends on um, individual uh, institution. And for us, at the time when we close the gallery, we tour uh, um, um, some of the best of the, the Impressionist paintings to to Asia, uh, we did uh, uh, receive a fee, an exhibition fee from the uh, from the lenders, and um, and we try very hard to uh, to work with different countries. For example, when we work with China, there was a, uh, 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 an attempt to uh, to because of the U.S. Ameri uh, the U.S. Uh, and also the Chinese uh, 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 relationship we managed to help China to get national indemnity for our artwork to be shipped from, um, uh, from America to China. And um, we, we received an exhibition fee, but somehow I personally, for, for us, as, of course there's a, a financial aspect we have to consider, but I prefer to work in uh, uh, exhibition that the lenders will not charge each other a big fee, uh, because if we, we receive a big fee from, uh, from say, a, a, a uh, a state um, museum in, in China, they pay a fee to get our work, but when we borrow from them, we have to pay a fee as well. And so it is, it is better that if we continue to do that kind of international show and to let the other lenders, uh, the, the lenders know that uh, we can work without involving a big fee of a lending. Still, to put up the show because of the insurance and the transport is still a very costly uh, a, a project. Yeah, so I think you also wanted to make a comment. Um, you know, because I work on modern contemporary and photography, so I don't really have experience actually on historical objects. And, and But um, in terms of funding for exhibition uh, dealing with Japan, of course, Japan Foundation, you know, is there, but the amount of their, you know, grant actually amount has been 
decreasing actually for you know last five years or so. So um, it's hard to expect them to give us a big sum, you know, to do a show. Uh, although, however, they do fantastic actually. Uh, uh, basically, research trips uh, sponsoring like a dozen curators every year. So uh, two years ago, you know, they came to me and why don't you organize a symposium in Japan and then bring your colleagues. So I, so I brought like a 10 curators from American museums. Uh, they all are interested in material from the 60s and 70s. So we had an incredible pack two week of exchanging ideas and looking at things and visiting artists and, you know, uh, so that was a really fruitful, uh, you know, way to, you know, work with the Japan Foundation. So, you know, if you are interested in working with any material in modern Japan, then uh, the foundation may be able to help you uh, to deepen your understanding and, and lay out your exhibition ideas. So, Korea yeah, Korea Foundation does too. So, um, we're up there. Hi, um, I just had a question which was more to do with, um, I think everyone on the panel has kind of described a sort of one-way exchange with kind of projects that were initiated by U.S. institutions and U.S. curators. And I was just wondering about if anyone had experience of an exchange that went the other way, being initiated by um, Asian curators and institutions. Um, and it, maybe this is more for um, um, the representative from the Asia Society and having to kind of translate those projects to um, U.S. institutions and within um, the sphere of, like, U.S. audiences. I only ask this because I'm from the Broad Art Museum and we're working with um, an adjunct curator from China, um, Dr. Wang Chun Chen, and um, he's um, proposing a project on contemporary Chinese art that is gonna be presented in the fall. So my question is about kind of how do um, American audiences um, kind of mediate um, the content from elsewhere and how do institutions kind of work with projects that are initiated from those regions? Actually, uh since I've been at Asia Society, I think even before then, almost all of the projects, or I think all of the projects that we've worked on, we've initiated in one way or another. Now, sometimes that means that we have gone to a curator who's based in Asia and asked them to develop the project for us, but um, I, can't, I can't think of any places where we've actually been approached by a curator with a proposal and, and had it happen that way around. Um, however, I think that there's probably that potential for sure. The project we work on are actually initiated um, by museums in Asia. The Shanghai Museum project actually uh, was initiated by the Shanghai Museum and um, we have the expert um, of Chinese painting coming to America to select exhibits from um, uh, uh, different museums. Um, we, we, we do have examples of some major museum. I mean, even the National Museum of China now in Beijing. Meetings has to happen, not just the emails and telephone. So I found that the face-to-face -face is very important to do business well in, in Japan, at least. insists that you go through the Ministry of Culture even for an artist who is alive. We just had that rule changed in February. Not in Japan. And on that note, <laughs> let's have lunch.